this is Michael Bozzi. Welcome to Marketing Without the Marketing. Really glad that you could be here today. I'm very excited to have a special guest on the show. Her name is Katie Tynan. Uh, she's the Managing Director of Core Access Consulting, and Katie's a writer, a speaker, and a consultant. Uh, her most recent book is called Free Agent, The Independent Professional's Roadmap to Self-Employment Success. Uh, her expertise is the evolution of work. And my clients and my listeners are, you know, solo businesses, small companies, startups, authors who are running their own business. And, and look, whether you're an employer or an employee, starting your own business, freelancing, indie working, whatever you do, you're going to want to hear Katie's take on how the changing world of work will affect you. So Katie, really glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Michael. It's great to be here. Well, glad to have you. So why don't we start with an overview, if you don't mind. How is the world of work changing? Could you just sort of cover that in a brief intro, please? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think a lot of people immediately point to technology and think that most of what's changed about work in the last decade or two is really about technology. And certainly technology is a big factor. We have things, tools, resources that we didn't have 20 to 30 years ago. But there's also a lot of other factors that are driving these changes about how employers and employees, people and companies relate to one another. And I think that's really the the most interesting trend. And then when you layer technology on top of that, it becomes something that really has a lot of momentum. So people want to work differently than they used to for a variety of reasons. And now we have the technical and technological capability to do that. And that's all coming together to drive a tremendous amount of change in these relationships between people and companies. Well, you know, I can speak to that from my own experience in starting my own company uh, at the very beginning of 2014. Uh, it's just, you know, it's very different than some of the other experiences that I've had uh, working for companies big and small. And I can see that for myself and, and my peers, too. It's, uh, uh, it's great. But could you go over, from your perspective, why you think this is a great time to start your own small business or, you know, do the solo thing uh, like you cover in your book? Yeah, it's a wonderful time. And I think back when I was, you know, early in my career and we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have the ability to communicate with people at a personal level. And I think that's really the fundamental thing that's changed. You know, we've heard a lot in the media about how business has become social, how what our friends recommend to us has much more influence than what we see if we watch a commercial on TV. So we have the capability as individuals to reach out directly to the people that might want to buy something from us and essentially eliminate that middleman of the company that takes some percentage of that work and keeps it for themselves. So it's a great time because we have those tools and those abilities. It's also a great time because there's a ton of variety in terms of what you can do to make money these days. So people need stuff. And they need really specific stuff that's different. They don't just want to go to Stop and Shop and buy things off the shelf. They might not want to go to Staples and buy something off the shelf. They want someone in a personalized way to sit down with them and say, I can help you. And that's what's really the secret for people who want to start their own business and people who want to break out on their own is if you know what you do really well and you know what people are willing to pay money for, specific people, mm -hmm. then you can certainly make a living doing that. And so it's just a tremendously great time from an opportunity perspective to go out on your own and to make a living. Yeah, and the means to connect directly with customers. I mean, that's what I talk about in uh, this podcast all the time, right, is the ability to reach people is there. I mean, it's still a lot of hard work, and, and it's not something that's easy. You need a strategy, all that, but uh, the access is actually there now, which is great. Yeah, that is definitely the case, and I think that it is certainly – necessary to do the work. So I will be the first person to say at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of this conversation that <laughs> it requires effort and work. I am not selling any get-rich-quick plans here. But if you're willing to put in the work, the tools are there. 
Oh, no doubt. No doubt. But Katie, what about from the other side, right? So think of the trends in this new world of work. How do they impact the employee as, as well, right? So think of that, whether you want to be an employee or actually for some of my clients and some of my listeners, you know, hire employees. Yeah. So there's a lot of shifting around. And if we if we roll the clock way back to before the Industrial Revolution, you know, there weren't employees and employers at all. There were farmers, there were tradespeople, there were people who did work and they got paid to do that work or they bartered for things that they needed. And then when we switched over and we had the Industrial Revolution, we started to have the idea of a corporation, the idea of an employer. And that's a relatively new concept in human history. You have to go back just 50, 60, 70 years, and that disappears. So we're not talking about a a whole lot of time that this employee-employer relationship has existed, but it's what we grew up with. It's what we know. But the fact that people are able to go out on their own, the fact that people want to go out on their own, and the fact that companies want to work with people in these flexible ways because it's more efficient for them means that everybody's just sort of recalibrating what it means to them to work, what it means to them to be a tiny business, to be an employer, all of those things. And it's complicated. It's not simple. If you're one person and you're running your business and then you decide that you want to hire your first employee, All kinds of things come into play from a tax perspective, from a regulation perspective, that are not simple for an average person to understand. And I think that's where it can be frustrating or confusing. But certainly these roles are shifting around and it's a very interesting space. Interesting things are happening. The question is for each person, what does that mean to you? What does Mm -hmm. it mean to you, Michael Bosey, to run your business? What does it mean to me as part of a business where we employ both individuals and contractors? And what does it mean to employers who want to work with independent professionals? Right. I love that, Katie, just because, you know, this is the effect of technology on, on everything. So why not the world of work too, right? Everything gets a lot more individualized. Uh, that's that's sort of the effect that it has. And it's just, uh, I love that uh, that it's not one size fits all. You can look at trends, but I like that you're thinking of that in a much more individu- individualized way. Now, so given that, right, so whichever path you, you, you're you choosing, whether you're going to be sort of, you know, run, run your own startup, small company, start a solo business, freelancing, indie working, whatever, or you want to be an em- employee, how do you advise people to find the right work for them, the thing that's going to, you know, fulfill them and satisfy them? Uh, what's your advice to them? Well, I want to start out by doing a little myth busting on the whole, you know, go find your passion love conversation. It, love it. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's the first piece of advice that people get when they say, I want to work for myself. People say, great, you should go find your passion. <laughs> and in some sense, let's just use my mom as an example. She loves to knit. Do I think she would enjoy knitting if she had to crank out 50, 60, 100 baby sweaters a day to make a living? No, I think she'd hate it. The fastest way to ruin a hobby is to try and make money off of it. So Finding your passion is not just about taking a hobby and turning it into money. It's about finding something that you do uniquely well that has high value to somebody else. So let's take technology. I spent 15 years in the IT field. I know a lot about technology and a lot of people don't. So there was a period of time where I made a really good living helping people understand how to use technology in order to accomplish their goals. And that's not sailing. That's not surfing. That's not some (laughs) of the things that I like to do in my spare time. But it's a value that I can provide, a unique value where I can help somebody. And it's this intersection of my talent, my interest, something that I'm interested in and I like to know about and do, and a value to somebody else. So There's a lot of things I could do, but there's a really specific subset of those things that I could do and make a really good living, and I happen to have a unique ability in that area. So when I think about, and people ask me about, you know, what should I do? I just read a fascinating article. I'll send you the link. 
that basically said for all these people who say, what's my passion, look at your life. What mm. do you do? What are the things you find yourself doing over and over again that people say thank you for, that people say, gosh, that you're really great at that. Those are some of the things you might want to start out with and look at and see if you have that interest and that talent and you can provide that value. All right, cool, Katie. We'll put that uh, link in the show notes. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, you know, given what you just said, do you believe in a perfect match then, right? The right business, the right sector, the right job? You know, I think it's a little bit like finding your soulmate. (laughs) I think that people (laughs) believe, again, that there's one person out there in the world that you might be destined to be with for your life. And I don't think that's true. I think there are a lot of potential opportunities and things that you could do that you could be great at. And you have to pick. And you might have 10 or 15 potential things that you could do. And you have to look at those 10 or 15 and say, you know, which one do I really feel inspired Mm -hmm. to do? Which one do I really feel like I've got a little bit ahead? I have some expertise or I have some things that would help me do this better than other people. So it is a little bit of an active curation process of those things that you could do. But I also want to say there's nothing wrong with picking a direction, going down that path for a little while and saying, you know what? I thought this was it. It's not it. Now I'm going to try something else. And to feel like that's okay. We're all going to reinvent ourselves repeatedly over the course of our lives. You don't have to pick something that you're going to do forever. <laughs> right, right. You need to pick something that you want to do right now. You know, actually, I just as a little side note, there's a, a guy, Derek Sivers, who you probably know. He has this concept of a now page. Mm-hmm. I, just, I just made mine recently with five things that are sort of top of mind now. And I just thought that was a really cool and clarifying concept. And he's urged a ton of people to just put one of those up on their website. And actually, he features them on uh, on his site, too. I think it's at nownownow.com. Again, another link for the show notes. But I just thought that was a great concept because the things that I listed uh, that are top of mind for me right now were maybe not the same things, you know, two years ago or you know, and are probably not going to be the same things two years from now. You know, it's it was just kind of a, a really great uh, self-reflective look and uh, cool exercise. So, yeah, no, that's great. And if you are uh, familiar with and if you're not, you should go take a look at his work with Chris Brogan and his work. Oh, yeah. He does a very similar thing, which is the, his three words. And every year he chooses the three words that are going to define his work. And they're separate words. They're not a sentence. But there are three words that he's going to use as sort of his guideposts for the year in how he's doing his work. And I think revisiting that now board or revisiting those three years, whether it's monthly or yearly or whatever point in time you want to, it can help you see that your priorities have changed or that your focus has changed or that what you care about has changed. And that's a good thing. We're all changing And we're all growing as people. We don't want to stay the same for our whole lives. Uh, So so it's a good thing to say, this is what I'm focused on right now, or this is what I'm going to focus on this year, and then evolve that over time. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Okay, so let's get right to the topic, the, you know, the core topic of this episode. How do you find your superpower, if you will, and then really focus on the right things to do, whatever it is that you choose to do in your career? How do you find it? And then how do you really focus on it? Well, in terms of finding it, I think a big part of it is is soul searching. It's about looking at yourself and recognizing in yourself what you do well. And I know that's really hard for some people. So I'm going to tell you my best advice (laughs) for how I learned to do it, which is go ask five or 10 of your friends what they think you're really good at. And they're going to look at you like you have three heads and say, Katie, don't you know that you're good at this? (laughs) (laughs) But you don't always realize what other people think of you as being their go-to person for. So go out and ask that question and ask it to people you've worked with, ask it to people in your personal life, and you're going to start to hear 
some common answers. You're going to hear, gosh, you know what you do really well? You write these amazing emails that just make everything totally clear. Or, you know, you're the one I always call when I can't figure out how to do X, Y, Z. So those are things to listen for. And that can help you narrow in on what is it that you do that brings value to other people. But beyond that, it's not enough to just know what you can do. You also have to narrow that focus down because that's the secret right now to being successful is we are in a busy, crowded, noisy world from a social media perspective. There are hundreds of thousands of people who do all kinds of really interesting things, and it can be easy to get lost and swallowed up in that. Part of what you need to do is focus down on who can you really help really specifically? Who is it that you can help? Who is it that's your customer that needs you and that's willing to pay money right, for right. this thing that you do? And that's the focus part I think that's really important in the early stages to differentiate yourself. How are you different? Not how are you the same? Not how many millions of things can you do? But what one thing can you really do that's different and special that you think you can find an audience for that's interested in that topic. Right. And it could be a customer or it could be your employer, right? I mean, I like that you you sort of put that into terms that it, it might not be these things that, that are immediately obvious that you could make money at. For instance, like suppose you're the person who's really good at bringing a meeting to a close or, you know, you're someone who is very good at, uh, you're sort of the, the, the glue that holds the group together. Like those are skills, those are abilities as well. And you may not immediately be able to see, oh, I can turn this into something marketable, but maybe that's a clue towards, you know, whatever your superpower is, right? Yeah. And I definitely want to go back to what you said about it could be your employer. So I'm weird. We all know that. Um, and <laughs> I don't ever think of my employer as an employer. My employers are my customers. My employers are my clients. Right. So sometimes I work as an employee. Sometimes I work as a freelancer or a consultant. I The structure of my role is not nearly as important as my mindset, which is I'm here in this particular role because I can bring a specific value to this organization. I can do something that they need. And so that's always how I think about it. And I think that's important when you're thinking about how you work. If you're an employee, you still need to always be thinking about how you're bringing value to that organization. That's your job security. If we can be said to have any job security right. ever, right. <laughs> which is if you are consistently and reliably able to bring value, but measurable value to an organization, then you're always going to be needed there and vice versa to a customer. So I would keep that mindset the same, no matter who you're working for. Yeah. I like the idea of sort of at least breaking that, you said myth busting, that was the term you used before, but you know, you're sort of a part of an organization and you have a clearly defined role, but you know, saying that, hey, look, it's not about that. It's about bringing value in whatever whatever you do. It doesn't, it, it sort of goes beyond the, the boundaries of role, yep. if you will. So now, you know, that kind of makes me think of just the concept of, well, think of when you're working for yourself or it's your own business or whatever, right, where you're sort of developing a brand. And we hear a lot about this sort of, you know, building your personal brand and doing this online and all that. And while that makes sense for a business, you hear a lot of this uh, for individuals as well. And this just makes me think that, uh, um, you know, what, what does that mean in, in your world? And what does that look like, even for those who want to work for others? Yeah, it's fascinating right now. The idea of personal brand goes so far beyond what we would have traditionally thought of as branding 10 years ago mm -hmm. when a company brands itself. What they are doing in a practical sense is they are making a statement about their values. So if you think about some of the biggest brands in the world, you look at Apple, you look at Google, you look at Coke, you look at any of those big brands. And let's just use a great example that's local to us, Dunkin' Donuts. So America runs on Dunkin', that's their brand. What does that mean? Well, you can look at that tagline and that brand and immediately understand that they are trying to give you something quickly, that they're trying to keep you moving in your day, 
all of those things that together encompass the whole concept of what Dunkin' Donuts is all about. If you then think about that from a personal level, social media has created a situation where we're all putting out a personal brand, whether we're being strategic about it or not. We all have some kind of personal presence out there on the web. And depending on how good you are with your privacy settings, you may have more of a personal brand than you think. So <laughs> right. kids these days, if I look at teenagers, I look at my son, they already know that. They're very savvy about audience, about who's out there looking at their stuff, about what image they're trying to project and what they're trying to put out there. And I think some of us who've been around a little longer, who didn't grow up with social media, we're playing catch up a little bit about understanding that we have a brand, that we have something that people are going to use to judge us. And I don't mean judge in the bad, evil way. I mean, they're looking for information. They want to understand who we are. So it's important as an individual to look at what you're putting out there and then to transition that into information that's useful and consistent so that people can connect with you about these things that you're interested in doing and that you're good at. So there's nothing wrong with having a personal brand out there. There's nothing wrong with having stuff on social media. I think some people say, oh, I'm not going to put anything out there and then people won't know anything about me and I'll be safe. Well, think, think about that. That's that's your brand too. If you're the person who doesn't post anything or you don't have an online presence <laughs> or you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I mean, that is your brand at that point. And exactly. it's saying something about you, so whether you you know, opt out or not. So, I mean, you really, you, you really don't have a choice. You either get to influence it or, or you don't. Yep. No, that's exactly true. And so I think from my perspective, the answer to that is you need to influence it. You need to decide what it is you want to put out there. And then you need to be pretty consistent about putting it out there and about curating it and about making sure that you're portraying yourself in the way that you want to be perceived. No, I like that. And I just did an episode uh, a couple episodes ago about that where it's, hey, look, when a customer or whomever, that could be an employer who's looking to hire you. I mean, what's the first thing that they're going to do when they learn about you, whether you're business or an individual, right? They're going to do a search. They're going to ask their friends about you. They're going to see, you know, what it is that you project. That's sort of the first level. Um, and if you're not there or worse, if, you know, if your brand or the brand that you're portraying uh, is not positive or, you know, it misses the mark, not consistent, I mean, that can actually do damage before they even meet you. You may not even get the interview or the meeting with the customer or whatever because they've already made a determination about you. And this is why it's so important to to do exactly what you just said. And And of course, I mean... Obviously, I would think this too, because to me, this all relates to content marketing, because uh, that's kind of what it is, even if it's an individual or a business. So I would ask you then, Katie, how do you think of it that way in terms of it, it's content marketing? And if so, you know, how do you use that to achieve your, you know, your work and your career goals? Yeah, that's a great segue to talk about the term content marketing, because I think a lot of people don't use those words, but that's what they're doing. Right, right. <laughs> so when you go and create a blog post or you go on LinkedIn and publish something, or even if you just put out a tweet on Twitter, every single one of those little tiny elements becomes part of this portfolio that represents you. And that is content marketing. So to me, the goal is to think of it like a portfolio and to show what you care about, to show that you are interested in certain topics, to show that you have ideas or that you have information that other people don't have. Or just that you're a participant, right? Like just that, mm -hmm. look, this person is interested in these things. You know, this person is is participating in the, in the discussion. I think even just that is enough sometimes. Right, to just be part of the conversation. And that can be as simple as liking something it can be as simple as sharing something that somebody else wrote. So right. you don't have to do a huge amount of personal content creation in order to be part of that discussion. No, totally agree. Yeah. A curation, as long as it's valuable to the, to the intended audience, it's just as important as creating uh, new content. So even for those introverts out there or the folks who feel like they're not good writers or can't do audio or video, that's fine. There's, 
you can still bring value to, to folks and you can still participate uh, by curating. That has value in and of itself. Yep, I totally agree. Well, Katie, if you sort of had to boil it down, you know, in this transition, which you see all the time, and I know that uh, you've written tons about this, what's the biggest reason that people sort of struggle with that transition from that, that sort of employee mindset to uh, independent business person or startup or solo or, or whatever, where they're, they're sort of moving from that traditional world of work to something that's not traditional? Well, part of it is because they have that little voice, usually of their mother, in their head <laughs> <laughs> saying, get a job. Um, so I don't know if you've seen Amanda Palmer's TED Talk. It's one of my favorites uh, when she talks about the art of asking. Yeah, Amanda yeah. Palmer, she's, she's a musician, and she talks about one of her first jobs which was standing on a street corner dressed up as an eight foot bride asking for money. Yep. And she said people would drive past her on the street and say, get a job. Right. And she right. would say in her head, this is my job. <laughs> so I think we grow up with this concept of what it means to be successful, what it means to have a job, what it means to be a breadwinner or to make money or all those terms that we grow up with. And they're all centered around stability. They're centered around this idea that you're going to get an education, whatever level that might be, and then you're going to go out and you're going to find a job and you're going to do that work and your employer is going to pay you for it. And that's a narrative that we've had for many, many years. Right. So I think it's something that initially people struggle with the idea of being a freelancer or being a free agent because it's simply not the narrative that we're taught. We're not taught that that's how you earn a living. We're taught that you're supposed to have a job. But in this day and age, it's something like 30% of the workforce that's self-employed. Yeah. And that's a substantial number of people who don't have jobs. So the question becomes, what's your personal identity? How do you think of yourself? And what do you think is success? What do you consider to be the right way to live your life? And Sure, that's partially defined by how you're brought up and what your parents tell you, but it's also defined by what you feel good about, how you feel you're doing your best work. And so for me, that's when I'm working for myself or I'm working within an organization doing something that I know holds value to them, that's when I feel great. So I don't put the label job on that anymore because that can take all kinds of different forms. But I do know that I'm really comfortable sort of flitting back and forth. I'm comfortable when I'm a freelancer. I'm comfortable when I have a relationship with an employer. I'm comfortable because I know that what I'm doing is important and valuable. And the minute that it's not, I'm going to stop. I'm going to look at that situation and say, I'm not adding value here. I'm not helping. I'm not doing my best work. I need to go find an opportunity to do that. That's a much more personal sense of self-control right, as opposed right. to, oh no, I'm going to wait until my employer decides they don't want me anymore. No, Katie, I love that because it means that you are in control, right? So free agent is the title of your book. And <laughs> I mean, that's the, the perfect way to, to describe that where it's not giving the employer the control. To me, that feels like, you know, people might say, oh, that's risky. You're starting your own business or you work for yourself or whatever. I feel like it's less risk because you're, you know, you're the one who's in control, not your employer. I mean, to me, uh, any sort of job is not, there's no job security. It's just job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and because as soon as some uh, something comes up or the business changes, your employer, uh, you know, goes a different direction or doesn't need you anymore or whatever. It's up to the employer, not to you. Mm -hmm. Like, it just feels like it's a lot safer to kind of uh, do what you're describing, even if that includes having a job or what, what is your job at the moment? What's the project you're working on now? But Well, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners read the article recently about HubSpot that Dan Lyons wrote. No doubt, yeah. And it's interesting to me, you know, that was a fascinating example because he was outraged about the idea of this VORP concept that they had there, which is the value over replacement person. Mm -hmm. And I think of that every single day in my life, which yeah. is, am I adding value 
to this customer, to this employer? Am I adding value in a way that's unique to me? Am I helping them more than someone they could hire off the street? And if the answer is no, if they're paying too much for me, if they're paying me more than I'm worth, I don't feel good about that. I right. feel like I need to fix it. And I think that's a mentality that people need to get more comfortable with. The idea that, yes, it's control that you have to say, I decide that I can add value here and I decide when it's time for me to leave. But it's also an honest relationship with that organization. And this gets into something else I'm sure we'll talk about, which is we've had a narrative, too, in this country that work is supposed to suck and you're yeah. supposed to go in and you're supposed to be miserable, but you're supposed to be, you know, getting paid for somehow getting over on your boss while you're talking at the water cooler. To me, that's a really disruptive and, it's and crazy, sort of right? Yeah, depressing narrative. I don't want that. So uh, that's the dialogue that, in my mind, we need to change, and that's the dialogue that I think is so much healthier when we all talk about and think about ourselves as free agents with value, and how can we take that value and help people, whether those are individuals, whether those are big companies, however that value gets expressed. No, that's true, and you know what I've always thought whether I'm doing what I'm doing now, where it's working with clients and, and all that, everything that you do, employer, self-employer, whatever, is an exchange of value, right? So if, if you're paying me and I'm happy with the rate that you're giving me or whatever, so you're paying me enough, I'm happy, but you think it's a bargain, then both sides are psyched, right? Because it's like, I'm helping you solve a problem that maybe you couldn't do otherwise. I feel like I'm getting compensated fairly, both sides are happy, and uh, you know, and, and I think probably the best relationships. Uh, that's sort of the the state that it's in, whether you're self-employed or with an employer. So, but the thing is, so why is that concept persistent then, Katie? Right, this work has to suck and it's going to be miserable and all that. Like, why does that continue to, to persist? Yeah, it's a funny question, and I think some of it comes to us from popular media, from TV, you know, we have these shows and we have a lot of, of visuals around people going to work and going, uh. And so I think when we all think about work and people will say to you, you know, work's not supposed to be fun. That's why you get paid. Yeah. It's the kind of things that we hear all the time, but you need to have a certain amount of challenge, a certain amount of risk, a certain feeling of personal growth in order to feel fulfilled about your life in the first place. So we want work to be challenging. We want it to be interesting. But it's really hard for big companies to create that unique, perfect experience that's just enough stress, but not too much stress right. yeah. for every individual. Companies are bad at that. So it's natural. I'm not surprised that employees end up somewhere that's on the spectrum, not necessarily the right spot of that stress scale. And then they do feel like work sucks because their boss asks too much of them or not enough of them, or they're not being challenged or they're being pulled to the ends of the earth. And I think that's part of why that narrative persists is because big companies aren't very good at personalizing a work experience. Right. And there's nothing we can do about that as individuals. The only thing we can do is say, I'm going to personalize my own work experience <laughs> and choose the job and choose the role and choose the opportunity. And then I can control that. And do I still have days that are crazy that I feel overly stressed? Yep, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. But I feel better about it because I feel like a lot of it is within my control and is my choice. And I chose to go down this path. And is a process and all that. Yeah. And I feel the same way in, in those moments where, you know, I've sort of taken on too much or didn't say no when I should have, you know, it's for me, it's it's all I only have myself to blame, right? I'm the one who's in control of it. So, you know, you take responsibility for it, learn from it, make a better choice next time. Now, Katie, I know that you offer a lot of help to folks through your consulting, through your writing, etc. cetera. So uh, can you tell the listeners where they can find you on the web? Yeah, so the best place to find me and interact with me is on Facebook. I manage a group called Indie Working. It's an open group, so we can post the link to that. And then, of course, if you want to learn more about me and see where I'm speaking and come and see me talk about some of these things or look at some videos that I've done in the past about 
how work is evolving to learn more about it, you can go to my website, which is katietynan.com. Excellent. That's super simple. Well, Katie, thank you so much for being here. This was really illuminating. I love the topic because I've been living it and uh, it's endlessly fascinating to me and just I thought would be really interesting to uh, my listeners here. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for having me. I've just so enjoyed having the conversation with you. All right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in as always. And uh, was glad to have you here as well. So on behalf of Katie and myself, uh, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next episode.